The support for socialism is growing across North America, and not just with young people like millennials, but also with celebrities and wealthy liberals. To discuss this in more detail is our regular correspondent, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, there appears to be support for socialism with some of the left-wing parties here in Canada, and it's growing in the States as well, but many see that as a very dangerous trend. Why do you think that is? super dangerous because it's growing among young people um it's become the most it's become like a popular culture uh trend but yet most people don't even know what it really means i'll give you the best best uh, analogy to all of this my very young uh, niece is about 10 years old and she and the family is a bit more of the bleeding heart and her mother sat her down over there playing monopoly with the family and she said this is how socialism would work um, you have to give me half of the money you have and you have to give me three of those houses that you put down on that property because i just don't have any houses and all of a sudden she's like that's not fair well you know she's only 10 but i think a lot of these college students and uh, and celebrities even are very hypocritical or don't know what it really means because no one is willing to give their hard-earned money away privileges away you know this is america it's where you know, the American dream was coined, meaning, you know, everybody works hard because there's so much opportunity. And the message to our young people should be, you work hard to get to those opportunities, not that they should be given to you. Um, so, you know, it's the fishermen and the fish, and they're just asking these young people to demand fish. You know, um, what was very telling was in, at the DNC this year, Bernie Sanders came on and said, you know, when I used to talk about these topics, meaning socialism, uh, people used to think I'm crazy. And now you see bits and pieces of it really making its way into the Democrat Party. And that couldn't be any truer. Um, you know, someone like a Joe Biden is pretty... Um, I'm, I want to use the word moderate, but I'm afraid to do so. Moderate meaning now he's moderate in the scheme or in the landscape of Democrats who have become extremely liberal, extremely left, extremely socialist. So, you know, I think that it's time for young people to be told the truth, for them to learn the definitions of socialism um, and liberalism and really decide for themselves what they want for their futures. Now, you mentioned Biden earlier. I'm just looking at a recent tweet here from Malik Obama. Was it the half brother to ex-president uh, Barack Obama? He's saying that if Biden does become the president elect becomes president, ISIS will return. Should we really be concerned? Yeah, no, I mean, this is it's an interesting tweet coming from the half brother of uh, President Obama, who was, um, you know, obviously, Biden and Obama ran together. Um, but, you know, let's put that tweet aside for a moment. We are in trouble with regards to our foreign policy. Look, President Trump was not afraid. He was not an appeaser. He was not there to just make friends with our enemies uh, without getting anything in return. I, we just did a piece this morning at the foreign desk uh, with a tall list of demands that the Palestinians now have from Biden, basically to overturn all of the Trump policies that were favorable to Israel. Well, what are we getting in return if we are going to overturn uh, these Israel policies? Well, with Israel, we have a reciprocity. What do we have? With the Palestinians. We cut their aid because they were they were basically paying for terrorism, paid to slay. They're paying suicide bombers families for them to go out and kill people. So, you know, same thing. We got a tall list of, of demands from the Iranian regime. This is what they want when Biden comes into power. So our enemies are definitely sensing that there will be a weaker leader at the White House. And to Mal Malik Obama's tweet, well, ISIS will probably sense the same thing. Iran has unveiled a new ship over the weekend, Lisa, and it's loaded with all sorts of weapons, including multiple launch rocket system or, or MLRS. How concerned should we be here in North America with the ship? Well, we should be concerned because we might have a president going into the White House who might want to make best friends again with the mullahs in Iran who are flexing their muscles, as you just indicated. Um, look, the, the pressure campaign under the, the Trump administration has been working. I hear this from the Iranian people, meaning they are willing to bear the difficulties of sanctions of a, of a pressure campaign by the United States if they believe, and they do believe, that it will lead them to perhaps regime change or at least to have a better upper hand against their government. Um, what President Obama did and what seems like what President, a, a potential President Biden would do is to loosen those reins and to allow the regime to 
you know, ha continue with its human rights abuses, to continue funding terrorism in the region, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, the list goes on, uh, to continue starving its people and putting that money towards its terror uh, endeavors and to get the bags of cash from the United States in order to fund this activity. Um, look, the Obama era foreign policy uh, vis-a-vis -vis Iran was horrific. It was horrific. It set us back and put us in a much more dangerous place. President Trump came in right away and fulfilled his campaign promise of withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal and put us in a place where we could put pressure on the Iran uh, regime in order to see some changes. And now, you know, who knows what we're going to see in the White House. But if Biden does anything uh, similar to what his boss Obama did, when we're not in a good position to fight the Iranian regime. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has a message for presumptive President-elect Joe Biden. Don't go back to the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, President... Um Bibi Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, has the most to be fearful of because he is right there next to Iran. Um, remember, the Iranian regime has called its enemies the big Satan and the little Satan, meaning the United States and Israel. So uh, Israel is in with, within arm's reach of of uh, Iran, and if they wanted to uh, retaliate, they would probably take it out on, on Israel. Um, so Bibi Netanyahu is asking Biden to think prudently for the region, for the stability and security of the region, to not enter in a nuclear deal, because that nuclear deal, all it did was it was a meaningless piece of paper that gave the Iranian regime some clout. It gave them breathing room. It gave them a sense of normalcy with the international community, rather than pressure them to make changes to their behavior. The U.S. officially pulled out of another arms control pact with Russia. This marks the end of a six-month notification process informing Moscow. Now, the Trump administration withdrew from the Open Skies Treaty, which was originally signed back in 1992. Explain the reason behind it originally. Yeah, if you remember, we talked about this six months ago, about why the United States would even give Russia the heads up. Um, you know, back it, when, when we did sign it, it was one of the only uh, pacts that we had with Russia to prevent any uh, future world wars. Um, it basically put a pact between the two nations. And now, as of this moment, we are pact pactless with Russia. Um, this puts the, again, presumptive Biden administration in a very... Um, a very, I should say, sensitive position to decide how they want to move forward with Russia and any meaningless pacts. The, the reason why the United States withdrew from this was because they thought that Russia wasn't keeping up with their end of the pact. And so they withdrew and they gave them, as you said, the warning six months ago. Azerbaijan forces have begun retaking territory held for nearly 30 years by the Armenian-backed government as part of a Russian-brokered peace deal. But Lisa, how long will this peace deal actually last? Yeah, you know, we've, we've had a few tries at this and it hasn't lasted. Um, look, both sides feel that they are entitled to their position. Um, and the fight is, is more than just the land. It's their pride. It's their nationalism. Both sides really taking this to the next level. We see a lot of the protests here in Los Angeles where there is a very large Armenian community, uh, expat community, and they have taken to the streets. They have taken to the embassies here to really... Um, fight for their their nation um there, there's been a lot of bloodshed and there probably will continue to be more bloodshed now that azerbaijan is forcefully taking the land back according to the peace deal that's what was supposed to happen uh but the armenians were burning their homes basically not wanting to give the land back um at least in in in, in the shape that it's in, um, and really being spiteful and, and upset, devastated by, by this decision. I do not think that this is going to last much, much longer. And unfortunately, there will be no true resolution in sight as both, both sides feel like they have a claim to the land. Chinese officials are furious as a top U.S. military intelligence general makes a visit to Taiwan. Lisa, under China's one country, two systems protocol, any official trip to Taiwan by a foreign power must ask permission from Beijing first. 
And I wonder why we sent someone there to really get under China's skin, right? Um, yes, so the U.S. has decided to draw a pact with uh, Taiwan. They are a country that needs the help, and the United States says, hey, we'll, we'll help you. And the pact is in the areas of health and security and technology, um, some, you know, water technologies and such. And, you know, there's, there's a long list of things that, that the United States can potentially help them with. And of course, we have heard the um, the upset that, that China is experiencing right now and thinking that they are being betrayed by the United States that has involved itself with Taiwan. And so the saga continues between the two world powers. New reports reveal that state-sponsored hackers from China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are attempting to steal coronavirus vaccine information in what security experts describe as an intellectual property war. Tell me more about that. Yeah, no surprise here. These are the same list of perpetrators who have always um, tried to steal intellectual property, whether it's uh, in apps or technology or devices or drones or weaponry. Uh, so it's no surprise they want to be on top fraudulently or fairly when it comes to the COVID vaccine. So the, the nations that you listed are, you know, actively trying to hack um, these companies that have any sort of information, any sort of uh, progress with regards to the vaccine. I mean, they don't care if they, you know, they copy and come out first or, you know, if they, where are we going to try them, you know? So they've gotten away with it for many years and they'll continue to do so. How much of a lockdown are you experiencing right now in Southern California during this pandemic? Yeah, we're, we're shutting down again. Um, as of Wednesday, there will be no outdoor eating again. You know, as you know, here in Southern California, we have decent weather, even though it's our, you know, fall, winter, we have very nice weather um, and we can eat out almost the whole year. Um, many restaurants have, have spent thousands upon thousands of dollars creating an outdoor space uh, with heaters and, you know, nice decor for patrons to be able to dine outside during this time so that they don't have to shut down completely or lose such a huge portion of their revenue. And now the governor has decided as of Wednesday, he will shut down all outdoor eating in order to slow down this second wave. Now, remember, this is the same governor who was caught um, a week or so ago at a very fancy restaurant up in Northern California, dining with none other than health officials from the state of California. Um, it's, it's awful. Both left, right, and center are calling out the governor. They're very upset at this hypocrisy. They're very upset at the businesses, the small businesses, the mom and pop shops, the restaurants, all the different people who are being devastated by this, these shutdowns. And of course, there is a pandemic, but you know we have to really weigh out the losses here, um, the depression, the bankruptcy, the, the families that are being torn apart. Um, and you know it's really, really horrific for someone to sit on his high horse and be such a hypocrite about you know not understand or not empathize with his constituents in the, a large, large state like the state of California that is a country in and of itself. So we're shutting down. The numbers are definitely rising, but um, you know my sister is a resident at a at a hospital in Riverside, California, and I think they have they they experience probably one of the largest um, you know uh, number of, of of patients and beds with with COVID patients. Uh, and she says there is a rise, but it's about seventy or eighty people at the hospital at at a time with COVID. Lisa, we only have about thirty seconds left here. As we head into a very holy holiday, comes word that the Palestinian Health Authority has recommended strict limits on Christmas celebrations in Bethlehem this year due to the coronavirus. Yeah, so this is obviously very upsetting for many who have the custom of making this trip every year, or at least walking in those steps every year. Um, the Palestinian Health um, Administration has decided that it is too dangerous to have more than 50 people even convened for the Christmas tree lighting this year. So it will be a very, very different Christmas, just as it will be a very different Thanksgiving for us here in the United States this week. Uh, we've been told not to convene for more. I think it's 10 people. Don't quote me on that. But no one's getting together because of that and because of the fear of, of getting together and all that. So just cancel 2020 altogether. Christmas, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, all of it. So it's upsetting. It is upsetting for many. Well, we live in some very challenging times. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thank you, Lisa. My pleasure.